A natural deep water harbour surrounded by no less than three national parks. Is it any wonder this place is called Eden? Overlooking majestic Twofold Bay, the township of Eden is a drawcard for tourists. White sandy beaches, rainforest walks and fresh caught seafood are irresistible attractions. But Eden is not just another quaint coastal town on the southern coast of New South Wales. This town has a more compelling story. The incredible story of the killers of Eden. An unlikely alliance between humans and killer whales. A museum that was built to preserve the memory of a whale loved by a township. The rise and fall of colonial entrepreneurs, the history of the local Yuan people, and the annual migration of hundreds of whales. In the spring of each year, whales pass close to the shore of Twofold Bay as they make their migration south to Antarctica. While humpbacks are the most common species to visit Eden, southern right whales, the gigantic blue whale, dwarf minke, pilot and sperm whales have all been sighted. The deep waters off Twofold Bay and the confluence of currents make Eden one of the best places in the world for whale watching. The waters off Eden are rich in krill, making the area one of the few places in the world where whales feed during migration. In recent decades, killer whales, often known as the orca whale or orca, with their distinct black and white colour, have been relative strangers to Eden, but now they're returning to the bay which was once the location of an incredible partnership between them and the whalers. Twofold Bay was discovered by Bass and Flinders in 1797, and it consists of two folds around a central headland, Kalkal Bay and Nullica Bay. When the killers go hunting, they would break up into their three groups of cousins because a superpod is one large extended family. One group of cousins would isolate or form sentinels around the inlet from North Head to South Head. One group would remain within the bay and the third group would be outside the bay harassing the whale and forcing it inside the line. Now when they harass a whale they're not quite like sheepdogs, although they're herding. They're more like bull terriers, and they're snapping and snarling and trying to force the whale into the bay. Once they have the whale inside the line from North Head to South Head, this group's pretty tired. The sentinels seal off the inlet and the second group take over, and they keep harassing the whale. The leader of the pod, in the days of Davidson whaling, which is from 1857 to 1930, would send three killers right across to the Davidson whaling station, where they would breach in the inlet, wake up the whalers, and then lead them back to where they had the whale bailed up. Before the Europeans arrived, they'd forced them onto the beaches to strand them, so that they could get the delicacy of the richest meat, which is lips, tongues and throat of the giant whale. Now going back thousands of years into the Koori dream time, because killers are black and white, and the Koori people, the Yuan people, are also dark-skinned with white markings, 
They thought they were reincarnated warriors or elders of the tribe and they were pushing the whales on the beach to feed them during winter. This went on for more than 10,000 years and of course a killer's lifespan is the same as a human so they would see the same killers year after year and this would reinforce their Dreamtime storylines. The Davidson whalers became good friends with their orca helpmates. Each whale was identified by its unique dorsal fin and was known by name. The collaboration between the men and the killer whales served both species. The whalers knew to let the killers feed on the delicate mouthparts of the hunted whales before towing the bodies to shore for processing. This became known as the law of the tongue. The story goes that this bond became so strong that some killers would leave the pod to swim across to the Davidson whaling station, where they would breach until the whalers responded and launched their boats. The killers would then lead the boats back to where the hunted whale was trapped. Given this bond, it's not surprising that the passing of the last of the killers, a whale called Old Tom, should have inspired such an unusual memorial. On the 17th of September 1930, while on his daily walk, Ali Gregg, a retired whaler, discovered the body of the killer whale known as Old Tom. This single event was the impetus behind establishing a museum in Eden, a place to commemorate the intriguing story of the unique working relationship between the whalers and the killer whales of Twofold Bay. The body was processed across the bay at Davidson Whaling Station, on the shores of Kaya Inlet. Local entrepreneur John R. Logan drove the vision and in February the following year sought out a committee to begin the project of establishing a home for the skeleton of Old Tom. Prior to the completion of the museum, the skeleton was displayed in the offices Logan had established for the Twofold Bay Development League which were located close to the main business area in Imlay Street. Unfortunately, Logan passed away late in 1937, never seeing his dream realised. This may well be the only museum in the world that was built as a memorial to a killer whale. The museum has a significant permanent collection, including its centerpiece, Old Tom. This is the only complete orca skeleton on display in the Southern Hemisphere. The gallery also contains a replica whaling boat and original artifacts from the Davidson Whaling Station. This is quite a small boat. This is a, a full-size replica of what they used. Five men rowing and one man standing in the stern steering. The harpooner would go up into the bow, he would leave his oar, and he would send that harpoon into the whale. And then the chase is on. Often the whale would sound, that means going right down to the bottom. They get then close enough to him when he's tiring, and amongst the oars you will see here a big blade on a bush pole on the other side there, that's the killing lance. And that has to be speared into the whale, into the heart or lungs to actually kill him. They'll mark it off with a buoy and they'll come back to it and tow it back to the whaling station where they'll flense it, that's get all the blubber off and boil the blubber down to get the oil. We've got mothers and calves in the bay every day on their way back to the Antarctic and the little mutton birds, the shearwaters also, on a massive migration around the Pacific Ocean. It's just alive with activity out there and it's wonderful that we're, we're now just watching them and not, not harpooning them. Yeah, yes, <laughs> that's true. So recognising the importance of nature, recognising the importance of our distinctive marine environment and celebrating the Whale Festival, I have great pleasure in announcing uh, the Whale Festival in Southern. Thank you.
The whale watching season is celebrated with an annual festival. The music and fashions might have changed, but it's not hard to imagine the townsfolk celebrating the return of the whales just as enthusiastically as in earlier times. Whale watching is big business. People travel long distances for a chance to glimpse at the giant of the deep. A breaching whale is the ultimate sight, bringing many to tears. We have noticed there has been a steady increase in the humpback whale population, which is really pleasing. This year we have noticed more mothers and calves than uh, ever before. And it is the mothers and calves that often come right in close uh, to the shores, particularly into the various bays, such as Twofold Bay here at Eden, giving the calves a chance to have a bit of a rest and uh, keeping them away from predators such as killer whales that prey on them. Once, whale sightings were marked with the cries of rush -o, rush -o. Today, the Eden Killer Whale Museum sounds a siren. This is the cue to make for the nearest lookout. Eden is fortunate to have the sheltered coves and the twin bay it overlooks. The geology of the region is a mix of soft and hard rock. The coast has changed significantly since the first human habitation. Twenty thousand years ago, the coastline lay about 35 kilometres to the east of here. Sea level was 130 metres below the present level and the coastline lay along the edge of the continental shelf. And this gorge is buried deep beneath sand now, but we can see it on sonar images. The rocky headlands are composed of the more erosion resistant hard rocks. And the sandy beaches are generally lying at the mouths of small rivers and estuaries, and the estuaries are developed in the softer rocks. The headland around Eden is part of the Killer Whale Trail, a self-drive day trip that links five historic sites. The Rotary Lookout at Eden provides views across Twofold Bay, making it an ideal spot for shoreside whale watching. Mount Imlay is visible on the horizon and Boyd's Tower can be seen on South Head. Nearby is the Seaman's Memorial Wall. It records the names of seamen lost at sea. Peter Lair, September 28, 1881. The wall was built after the loss of the crew of the fishing trawler the Shira Lee in 1978. When it was built in 1883, the Green Cape Lighthouse was the tallest concrete structure in New South Wales. It was located at the Cape to protect vessels from the rocks beneath the Cape and to prevent captains from losing their way when traversing Twofold Bay. Benjamin Boyd was a significant figure and entrepreneur in Australia between 1842 and 1849. At one time, he was one of the largest landholders in Australia, with holdings of more than 810,000 hectares. Boyd's future slipped through his fingers, however. He was bankrupt by 1848 and left for the Californian goldfields the following year. In 1851, he went missing in the Solomon Islands and was never seen again. Boyd left a lasting legacy in Eden. Boyd's Tower, 34 kilometres south of Eden by road, was built in 1847 from Piermont sandstone. An extravagant folly. It was intended to operate as a lighthouse, 
but the government of the day denied Boyd permission. The tower instead became a lookout point for whale spotting. The Seahorse Inn, eight kilometres south of Eden, is Boyd's major legacy. A mixture of Elizabethan, Georgian and Tudor styles, construction began in 1843 using convict labour. The inn was part of a grander scheme, Boyd Town, but was never completed due to the collapse of the Boyd Empire. The building was in ruins until Richard Bromley Whiter bought the structure in 1936 and commenced a major restoration. The place was in absolute ruins. There wasn't a pane of glass left in the place. People had been camping in the old building and chopping up the flooring for firewood. Fishermen had been stealing lead out of the roof flashings to use in their fishing operations and of course that allowed water to get into the building. My grandfather set to work with two of his boys and some other helpers and they got busy restoring the inn. The Davidson Whaling Station has changed little since it was built in the 1860s. It's here that the humpback and southern right whale carcasses were winched ashore and processed. The whale was lanced to release noxious gases. Then the blubber was sliced from the carcass and dropped into scalding containers known as tripods. It was heavy, hard work, and the smell was overwhelming. Whale oil was a valuable commodity in the 19th century. With the discovery of substitutes such as kerosene and vegetable oils, the use of whale oil declined. There was a time when Eden was being considered for the home of the nation's capital. In 1900, the Lands Appeal Court favoured Eden because of its deep water harbour. But the New South Wales Parliament voted against the proposal, fearing Eden's port would compete with the trade of Sydney. One of the constant in Eden's colourful history is the annual visit to this peaceful area of the Wales. The migratory route that brings these, the most majestic of creatures, to Twofold Bay remains one of Eden's most compelling drawcards. <laughs>